Hi, I've had a busy week this week. First of all, I played against Maradona, probably one of the best players in the world at his time. And also this week, I have a very important match against Turkey for England Wembley. Don't miss it, but more about that later. First, this. Coming up, reigning champions AC Milan on the goal trail against Napoli. James Richardson on the season's first managerial casualties and all the news behind the headlines. All the goals from last Sunday's Serie A. Win a shirt worn by one of your Italian heroes in our weekly competition. From Seville, it's Gaza's golden goal in the Gascoigne Maradona clash. Gaza gives us his verdict and takes us through his week. And we preview next week's vital World Cup qualifier, Italy against Scotland. Well, I've had a fantastic week. I've been at Euro Disney. I've played against Maradona. Um, I'm with the England camp, training, looking forward to the Turkey game. But what has been a very important match and a big match in Italy this week has been Napoli versus AC Milan. And here are some of the highlights. It's not too long ago that Milan were casting envious eyes at Napoli's championship success. But how times have changed. Napoli's coach Claudio Ranieri will attempt to put the handbrake on Milan without Brazilian striker Careca, he's suspended. When it comes to goals, Daniel Fonseca, the Uruguayan, seems happy to oblige. He's scored in all but two of Napoli's league games this season, and certain Milan are already taking notice of him. Rude Hullet is one of 13 first-team players at the club who are unable to find a place in this Milan starting at left. Iranio and Simone are the two surprise choices of coach Fabio Capello. Between them, they figured in just four league games this season. Marco van Basten's appetite for success doesn't seem to diminish. He's scored eight times this season and is Milan's leading goalscorer. Rijkaard wins the ball back for Milan, but unfairly. Turn will leave the free kick. Zola got it wide again, here is Zola. But Aze got in the way, only as far as Zola though. Into the dead ball line, that's a terrific cross. Oh, what a wasteful opportunity that was. And Daniel Fonseca, the man who scores goals for fun, was virtually unmarked underneath the crossbar when that ball came across. Terrific play by Zola to skirt round the outside of the Milan defence. On second, knows he should have done better. This is Maldini. Berezi. Oh, that was dropping invitingly for Simone. Before Ferrara got across to divert the ball away for a corner. Ronio will take it. Rijkaard, here's Van Basten, he's created a little bit of space, and he's created a goal. Six minutes in, Milan have the lead, and Marco Van Basten, with goal number nine of the season, gives the champions a superb start. I think you have to level some criticism here at the Napoli defence, because once the ball had funneled through to Van Basten, look how they stood off him. Policano invited him to shoot, and you can't do that with Van Basten. Turn. Fonseca still has the ball. Three red shirts around him, and still manages to strike a ball with some venom at that Milan goal. My goodness, they'll have to put Fonseca deep inside their pocket, won't they? He's really going to cause Milan a problem or two in this game. Mauro. And a free kick to Napoli.
Well, Adini made the mistake. It's cost his team 15 yards. And it might cost them a goal. Here's Van Basten. 2 0. Well, Napoli have been generous to a fault at both ends of the field now. No wonder Tarantino is distraught. This was some very sloppy defending, and bear in mind Fonseca has wasted a really good chance for Napoli in this game, and now the other end, they've gifted a goal to Marco van Basten, his second of the game. Ranieri, it's a very, very lonely figure indeed down on the Napoli bench. Costa is Baresi. Tassotti. Van Basten. Rijkaard. A sweeping move which culminated in the two Dutch players. Frank Rijkaard and Marco van Basten combining effectively. Perhaps Rijkaard felt he should have at least forced the goalkeeper into a save. Mauro. The foul on Mauro penalised. Another free kick to Napoli. Policano lining himself up for a shot on goal. And my goodness, Napoli need a goal now. 2-0 down to Milan. Here's Policano. Zola! Was it a shot or was it a cross? I'm not sure even Zola knew the answer to that question. Here's Policano's fearsome drive, which was moving away from goal, and Zola knew that. Albertini getting it wide again. Here is Albertini. A ball in behind the back of the Napoli defence. Caradini trying to head it behind for a corner. Seemed to come off Simone. One or two disturbances in the stands, which you can see now as the Napoli and Milan fans clash in the Stadio San Paolo. This isn't what Napoli need, either on or off the field. Meanwhile, back on the field, Milan are attacking again with their substitute, Massaro. Erronio! Well, the Napoli fans will be even more disappointed now. That surely now has taken the game beyond the grasp of Napoli. In the end, a very, very simple goal, but what a very effective one for Milan. Lentini. Massaro. Rijkaard arriving. Van Basten took a theatrical dive. They weren't that impressed with a gymnastic leap by Van Basten here. He was being impeded, though. Tarantino's had a wretched afternoon trying to keep Van Basten quiet. Here's Albertini, Van Basten! Oh, wow, Tarantini was busy arguing with the referee. He forgot about Van Basten as well. A hat-trick now for Marco Van Basten. 11 goals this season, three of those have come here against Napoli. Talk about a defence in disarray. They looked like they were standing at a bus stop, watching the wrong bus go past. And there was Van Basten with an easy tap-in. Zola. He 
even the goals of Fonseca now would be unable to spare Napoli inevitable defeat Rijkaard and Baston doesn't feel he has to challenge for those anymore he's done his job somebody else can have their turn Ferrara Antonioli equal to the shot and whilst Milan is scoring them they can save them too This really was an excellent volley by the fullback. Donadoni. Antman has his flag raised on the far side. Zola. Clear now of Tessotti. Still Zola. That's quite a run. And is that a penalty? No. Really did roam creatively in the Milan half of the field then. Cut inside Costa Curta. Gorezi. Ooh, I think just about made contact. Maldini followed through. It's a day when little has gone right for Napoli. Ever since Fonseca headed over the crossbar with the entire goal at his mercy. Mauro gives it to Van Basten. That's oh. cruel. That really is cruel. It's the first time Marco Van Basten has scored four goals in an Italian Serie A game. Mauro's pass was to perfection. Mauro could have been wearing a red and black shirt. It was that accurate. And Van Basten even had time to look round size the situation and score his fourth of the game and Napoli's hopes up in flames they trail by five goals to nil they're heading for one of their heaviest ever defeats and the Neapolitans here just can't stomach what is happening down on this football field oh they have a goal put the fires out Napoli are back it's only one courtesy of Zola but at least it's something to cheer on a quite miserable afternoon what a well struck free kick it was all the goals from last Sunday still to come, but first, James Richardson with News of the Week. Good morning, and time for a selection of the week's newspapers, starting this week with some famous last words. These from Daniel Fonseca of Napoli before his team's match with Milan last Sunday. Fonseca tells us the draw isn't enough for us. Well, uh, Napoli's destruction by Milan last Sunday was accompanied not just by the sound of Fonseca munching on his own words, but also of the last draw breaking. On Tuesday came the announcement that Claudio Ranieri, the team's coach, had been relieved of his command. His replacement? None other than Ottavio Bianchi, the man who, with Maradona, guided the team to two Italian championships in the 80s. Bianchi has had a somewhat stormy relationship with the club, both as a player and a coach. He was fired by Napoli's president, Corrado Fellano, in 1989, despite Napoli's second place in the championship. The reason? Deep unpopularity with both the players and the management. This time, Bianchi's contract with the club is only until the end of the season, but for those seven months, he'll earn a quarter of a million pounds. Well, along with the news of his appointment comes the resolution to the rather surprising events up in Genoa. After their loss against Cagliari last Sunday, Genoa's players had to be escorted past angry fans by the police, and their coach Bruno Giorgi declared enough is enough and offered his resignation. Two days later, Genoa found his replacement. Step forward the amiable Gigi Maifredi, one-time hero of Bologna and prophet of the zone style of defence. 
It's a system, however, he didn't have much success with in his last tenure as a coach here in Serie A, lasting just one season, 1991, at Juventus. We wish him the best of luck in his new position, as we do to Atavia Bianchi down in Napoli. They're not the only two names on the move, however. The Wednesday saw the end of the November trading market here in Italy, and Foggia stole the show on the last day with their surprise purchase of the Dutch international and Ajax striker Brian Roy, what the Corriere della Sport rather cunningly called a Royale strike. The price here in Italy has been quoted as £5 million, pounds, although the figure in Holland has been put at about half that. Now, despite a lot of talk, very few big names have been on the move this week. The swap of enters Stefano Desideri plus a million pounds to Udinese for their midfielder Antonio Manicconi has gone ahead. Desideri consequently missed uh, Wednesday night's friendly with Stuttgart, in which the Inter team was beaten 5-0, and he's probably very glad he did too, because Inter's president, Ernesto Pellegrini, was so ashamed of his team's performance that he's ordered the entire squad, barring, of course, coach Bagnoli, to be fined for their really lacklustre showing. The other big news, of course, this week was the showdown in Seville, the big matchup between Paul Gascoigne and Diego Maradona. Now, highlights of this game are coming up, so you have to wait to see just how or why Gaza enchanted Maradona. Maradona, in fact, was so taken by the Geordie that after the game, he told reporters, Paul will be to Lazio what I was to Napoli, which conjures up images of a Scarface Gascoigne immersed in talcum powder, running around buying motor cars and imprinating women. Now, while Maradona's lawyers fuse the Channel 4 switchboard, we'll take a short break, after which we'll be back with the highlights of that lazio Sevilla game and a competition with the chance to win a trip here in Italy. See you then. Welcome back. Our competition coming up, but first, a look back at Sunday's goal. Ancona played host to Brescia in what will probably be Ancona's last game at the Dorico Stadium before moving to a new location. And the Ancona fans were given the perfect start, with Hungarian Lajos Tatari releasing Agostini to score in the 11th minute. Tatari left Brescia's sweeper Zigliani with his legs in the air. Agostini then pounced. Well, shortly before half-time, Dottari stepped up to score Ancona's second with his free kick from 30 yards. It's goal number six of the season for the Ancona playmaker. What a brilliant strike. And then it was a case of whatever you can do, I can do better, from Brescia's own free-kick specialist, Georges Haji. The Romanian made room for the shot with his cleverly worked free kick, which had come straight from the training ground. The spectacular goals continue to flow in the second half. Agostini heads down and Fabio Lupo creates this masterpiece. Lupo had been sidelined for six games, which proved ample time to brush up on his goal-scoring technique. Dottari, surrounded by the entire Brescia defence, still managed to thread the ball through to Ruggeri, who wanted too much time. Well, then Brescia's hopes for a recovery nosedive once Landucci received the red card for this blatant flouting of the rules. An old-fashioned up-and-under, this time left Zildiani kissing the playing surface. Agostini race clear, 4-1 to Ancona. The number nine, known as the Condor, bided his time before pouncing for his third goal of the season. In injury time, Agostini wrapped things up with yet another Ancona special. The bicycle kick seems to be all the rage in Italy these days, and especially on the Adriatic coast. Agostini will have enjoyed that, despite a touch of cramp. 5-1 to Ancona, it's their biggest win in three seasons. Atalanta hadn't beaten Foggia at home for 25 years going into this match, but they were ahead after only 40 seconds. Peroni's cross was touched on by Gantz for ex-Foggia forward Rambaudi to score. Foggia was soon level. Bianchini's attempt to reach Biagioni's cross was impaired by Montero's push, and that's a penalty. Biagioni converted his second penalty in consecutive games. On the stroke of half-time, Atalanta were ahead for the second time. Porrini on hand with that well-timed header. 
a former Milan player, hadn't scored for three seasons. Two went up at the interval and Gans failed to increase Atalanta's lead here. Gans has been in sparkling form in the early part of the season. His sixth goal of the season was denied by Mancini in the Foggia goal. Biagioni then tested Ferron's reflexes. And moments later, Nicoli's challenge on Ferron meant the goalkeeper would play no further part in the contest. Well, the bruising encounter soon saw another clash. On this occasion, Valentini and Medford collided. But it was the Costa Rican Medford who took the brunt of the challenge. He was concussed. Despite leaving on a stretcher, he was all right. Well, inevitably, Atalanta's counter thrusts involved Rambaudi and Gantz, the former Brescia striker this time denied by the uprights. Despite this miss, one suspects Gantz will feature among Italy's Capo Cannonieri at the season's end. It finished 2 1 to Atalanta, they move up to mid table. Roma travelled to Florence without the suspended international Giannini and Rizzitelli and with Thomas Hessler dropped. Fiorentina were determined to avenge their Italian cup exit at the hands of Boscov's side. Benedetti cleared from Pioli's header early on. Jano then teased Aldair, but the German international Stefan Effenberg was unable to convert this cross. Roma should have gone ahead midway through the first half. Piacentini crossed, but Aldair missed this guilt-edged opportunity. On the half-hour mark, Fiorentina's opening goal came from an unlikely source. Giuseppe Iacchini driving home from 25 yards. It was only the midfield player's second goal in four seasons. The bounce clearly deceived Cervoni in the Roma goal. Four minutes later and Fiorentina scored again, Orlando finding the ever-widening gap in the Roma defence. Effenberg and Battistuta then combined, the Argentinian shot palmed away by Cervoni. Then Roma's Argentinian international Claudio Canizia tried to stamp his mark on the game. First with this tame effort at goal, and then with this fine run, which wasn't matched by the quality of the cross. Still, was Carnavale's tumble a result of a push? Roma's recent disciplinary problems continue. Substitute Roberto Muzzi was sent off moments after coming on for his attempt to injure Bayano. The referee had strong views about Muzzi's intentions. The replay confirms the referee was right. So Roma down to ten men for the third consecutive game. Mikhailovic with that long-range effort causing problems in the Fiorentina defence. And then with 20 minutes to go, Roma pulled one back when Canizia headed home Carnavali's cross. Brian Laudrup having a quiet time following his explosive baptism to Italian football set up the game's last chance. Betty Stuta's drive saved by reserve goalkeeper Sinetti. He'd replaced the injured Cervoni. 2-1 then to Fiorentina, the final score, and they move into the top five. Genoa came into this match without Scuravi and Van Schip both dropped. Caleri had never beaten Genoa in the Luigi Ferrari Stadium, and they could be forgiven for believing their bad luck was set to continue. And Pedavano gave Genoa a ninth-minute lead. However, Caleri's response was immediate. Napoli stole in at the far post to level the scores. Four minutes later, and Panucci scored his second goal of the season, 2-1 to Genoa. A free kick to Genoa from just outside the penalty area is always ominous. Padovano's deflected shot just kept out by Yelpo. The second half belonged to Cagliari, especially after this crew challenge by Signorini on Francescoli produced a red card for the Genoa captain. Signorini's wounded act failed to convince the referee. Mattioli touched the ball for Buscedu to shoot past Tacconi, and another goal. That's Buscedu's second of the season, coming against one of his former clubs. The away side made it three wins out of their last three games when super sub Luis Oliveira connected with Napoli's cross. 
It's the second goal in two games for the Brazilian. Panucci, Genoa's only outstanding player, almost grabbed a last gasp equaliser, foiled there by Yelpo. It finished 3-2 to Canary, which brought the Genoa faithful out in force and blocked the player's exit. The unpleasant scenario also prompted the coach, Bruno Giorgi, to hand in his resignation. On a happier note, Canary move into the top seven for the first time in over a decade. But now let's get back to the action. And on Tuesday, Paul Gascoigne and his Lazio teammates travelled to Spain to face Seville and their newest signing, the mighty Maradona. Peter Brackley reports. It's a disappointingly small crowd for this, the latest in a series of friendly matches designed to help pay off Maradona's transfer fee. This is Arndt Victor for Lazio off the bar. And I think that Zui, the Seville goalkeeper, just got a touch to that then. It was a cracking effort by Arden Winter, who's been playing so well for Lazio since his move from Ajax back in the summer. One of the foreign players vying, of course, for one of those three places. And indeed, Unzui just got a touch to that. Seville currently lying fifth in the Spanish league. And this is Andrades. Good strike. Oh, great save too by Orsi who's the second-choice goalkeeper at Lazio. Dino's off keeping the regular choice, Fiori on the bench tonight. Gascoigne to Bonomi. And another fine save by Unzui. Catapulting himself across the goal to defy Bonomi, the Italian under-21 international. Unzui, who was the former number two to Zubi Zaretta in his Barcelona days. Excellent save. This is Simeone, now then to his fellow countryman, Diego Maradona of Argentina. Maradona just flitting in and out of the game so far, really. Matagon. This is Pineda. Oh, what a goal! And Orsi was completely wrong-footed by that. You have to fault the goalkeeper's positioning there. Marvellous strike by Pineda. But Orsi won't be too happy with the way that one sailed past him. And Seville take the lead on the half hour. The goal scorer, Pineda. Showing a lot of confidence to drive it in from long range. And Orsi clearly in the wrong place. So a setback for Lazio, who trailed by a goal to nil. Lazio, who started the season fairly promisingly, of course. Their only defeats against the top two, Milan and Torino. Winter, Gascoigne, that's a lovely turn by Gascoigne. And a great finish. Oh, that's a fabulous goal by Paul Gascoigne. He's been suffering with the virus this week and, of course, still hoping to recapture full fitness in general terms. And that goal will give him immense pleasure. Wriggled away from the marking there, and he takes on one, two, three defenders before sliding the ball into the corner with great aplomb. It's 1 1, and it's a goal for Gaza. Five minutes to half time. And that really is the mark of a quality player. Just strolling past defenders and guided into the corner. Beyond the despairing reach of Unzui. Maradona. Van Gogh with the run. And a free kick to Seville. Dino's off, looking on anxiously as his team prepare to face this free kick. And he'll know all the tricks that Maradona has up his sleeve. Whipping it through, oh, a good piece of goalkeeping then by Orsi, who certainly had to be on his guard. Maradona's forte, of course, the set piece, and he whipped that one in, curling it round the wall. Mango, Maradona, now Cotillo, a chance here, still Cotillo, and denied by the alertness of Orsi. 
So Lazio escape, but again we saw there the vision of Maradona. Letting in Cortillo, who cuts inside the challenge of Madonna. And then it's all down to the goalkeeping of Orsi. Corner then to Seville. Here's Maradona. Oh, delightfully done. And I think just Orsi got a touch again. As Losada came in at the far post. But the magic then of Maradona was a joy to behold. Such trickery from the genius. Magnificent touch. And so nearly a goal for Seville. Well, he may not have the pace of old Maradona, but he still has all the gifts intact. Mango to Maradona. Almost strolling through this second half now. Seville seeking the winner. Tackled by Gregucci. And my word, that was a clattering challenge. Yellow card. Simeone, the former Pisa player. And Dino Zoff will be wondering what Maradona can conjure up here. The master of the free kick. Oh, off the bar with Orsi motionless on his line. <laughs> well, a major disappointment for Maradona. Looks ruefully to the heavens. No hand of God or assistance from God on that one. Fantastic free kick, though, by Maradona. Beats the wall, beats the goalkeeper, but not the crossbar. So let's get the Gaza verdict on this match and on his whole week. Hi. Uh, sorry I didn't see you last week. Um, as you know, I had a uh, tremendous flow, bad in bed. Even though Chris just wanted to uh, film me in bed, I was sorry it was not possible. I didn't look the best of times anyway. Uh, but yeah, I'm back again. Uh, missed the game. Very disappointed because everything seems to be going well for Lazio. Um, and unfortunately, we got beat. Um, I was disappointed, you know, on my own goal and uh, another silly goal we give away. But we're still hanging in there and battling. Obviously, Milan is storming on it as usual. Um, I've had quite an interesting week uh, this week. Um, I went to Euro Disney, which I, I enjoyed. It was good uh, on my day off. And uh, I had the match against Maradona. Um, I didn't realise how little and stocky he was. Um, the match, obviously, there wasn't many people there. I was quite surprised, only 1,500 people. I got a goal, but never mind. Uh, I need to turn them into the championship. I think Maradona, uh, he kept everything simple because, he, you know, I think he knows himself, he's getting on a bit. Uh, he can still produce the free kicks, as we've seen. You know, he's done some great free, free kicks. Um, but he, I think he was just taking his time and uh, keeping it all for the championship. He spoke to me after the goal and uh, he asked me how my knee was and uh, said it was a great goal. So it was compliments he'd come to the dressing room and he wished all the players good luck for the season. Um, I suppose that was nice of him anyway. I still remember the hand of God. Okay. I tried to kick him for you, Peter. Peter <laughs> I'll be going with the England camp and uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to the game against Turkey. I thought we played really, really well at home to uh, Norway. Um, but you can you cannot argue um, about a goal like that. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this match again. All the lads have been great spirit. The crowd were fantastic, and no doubt there'll be a great crowd there again. Uh, let's just hope that we can turn that 1-1 uh, into maybe a 2-0 win or a 3-0. Well, I've been in Italy now. Um, for five months now and uh, for two years I've been watching the, the derbies. Um, we've got the derby coming up in uh, two, two weeks' time. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Really looking forward to it. Um, I think it's probably one of the biggest derbies in the world, if not the biggest derby in the world, as people tell me. Um, they'll have pigeons, white pigeons in there. The flags will be up, the fireworks will be flying. Um, let's hope one of them fireworks hits me right up the backside. Gets me going. <laughs> Welcome back. Italy versus Scotland preview to come, but first, the rest of the goals from Sunday's Serie A. 
Sampdoria and White had beaten Inter four times in the last six meetings of the two clubs. And Sampdoria's Des Walker was soon giving away a penalty for the trip on Bertie. Walker's mistimed challenge a rarity, as the folks back home in Nottingham will testify. Rubin Sosa couldn't take advantage of Sampdoria's charity as Paliuka saves with his knees. Paliuka has something of a reputation for saving penalty kicks. Sampdoria, who felt they'd been let off the hook, then tried to catch the big fish themselves. Mancini going close. Into the second half now, and Inter, who've done well in recent weeks, went for the decisive goal. Number seven, Bianchi, tests the reflexes of Paliuka again. Sampdoria have never really got over the departure of Viale to Juventus, but Serena, who came from Juventus via Verona, almost gave Sampdoria the lead. But then Darko Panchev, the footballer with a name like a South American revolutionary, couldn't break the siege of the San Siro. Lombardo's speed is normally a feature of Sampdoria's attacks. Here is long-range shooting, catches the eye. Goalless then in Milan, Inter dropped to fourth place. It proved to be the Roberto Baggio show in Turin, where Juventus met Udinese, but Baggio had to be a little patient for his first goal. 20 minutes in, Baggio finds a target, Torricelli's cross, and Baggio on hand to volley it in. Only two minutes had elapsed when Baggio scored again. The Udinese defence and two pigeons couldn't catch him as he made it 2-0. It's Andy Muller who supplies the scoring pass. Italy are hoping Baggio can repeat this against Scotland at Ibrox in the World Cup qualifier. Muller turned provider again two minutes later. Baggio's shot is deflected off Pellegrini and Juventus lead by three goals to nil. Juventus weren't having it all their own way. Balbo put through here, and the Argentinian hits the target from an acute angle. You'd have to go a long way to find a better goal in Europe at the weekend than this one coming up from Roberto Baggio to claim his hat-trick. Look at the first touch of Baggio, a casual flick up off the knee, which enables him to turn Pellegrini, followed by an accurate volley. Branca spurned an opportunity early in the second half to drag Udinese back into this match. Before you-know-who was tormenting the Udinese defence again, this time Di Sano was grateful to hang on to the ball. Juventus only cloud on a day of sunny football was a sending off for Peruzzi for that deliberate handball. The gloves came off, but Juventus hadn't given up the fight. Rampula came on as Juve substituted an outfield player. Rampula soon in the thick of things. Baggio was soon in the thick of things at the other end. He'd already had a goal ruled out for offside before he netted his fourth, finishing off this four-man move. So Juventus follow up their 5-1 win over Ancona last week with a similar scoreline this. Paul Gascoigne was laid low with flu for Lazio's home game with Torino. In fact, his teammates seemed to have caught the same virus. Their first taste of medicine came early on as Venturin forces a save from Fiore. The German international Thomas Doll's knowledge of Italian is coming on in leaps and bounds. He can now insult an official in two languages with identical results. He had a frustrating afternoon, though, before his sending off, he felt he should have had a penalty here. Lazio must have felt their luck was in when Silenzi scooted round the Lazio defence, only to be denied by the post. Torino turned the screw. Sergio, the ex-Lazio man, provided this cross for Schifo. But if Lazio do have a match winner, they need look no further than Beppe Signori, who finished off a two-man move which spans 75 yards. That's his tenth goal of the season. Signori was being watched by Italian national coach Arigasaki, who must be impressed with the striker's finish. Well, some bizarre defending proved to be the undoing of Lazio here. Aguilera was the lucky recipient of the loose ball. Fouzer's determination almost restored Lazio's lead, but Marco Gianni was equal to the shot. Signori was still prepared to take on the whole of the Torino defence, single-handed. 
before the deciding goal. 88 minutes in, Sordo's corner headed on by Fortunato. Gregucci with an own goal. It's Torino's first win over Lazio in Rome for 17 years. Pescara in blue currently prop up the rest of Serie A and almost fell behind early on. Now, if you want Brazilian skills, how about this from goalkeeper Teferel? Teferel got his come up and shortly afterwards and looks less comfortable receiving this shoulder barge. There's a suspicion of offside about the only goal of the match, scored by Palmer. Minotti's header is saved, but Pizzi thrashes in the follow-up. Now, watch out for Minotti, the white-shirted player on the extreme left of the six-yard box. Was he in an offside position when he headed the ball? Final score, 1-0 to Palmer. Palmer move up to mid-table security. At the top of the table, fine victories for both Turin clubs. Sees the pair lying second and third. Perhaps the most surprising name in the leading pack is that of Cagliari. This could be a memorable year for the Sardinian side. The real question is, how do you stop Milan? Napoli couldn't, and they've slipped into the relegation zone. It seems Claudio Ranieri's days at Naples are numbered. Another big club in trouble, Roma. That defeat at Fiorentina was their third in a row. And still rock bottom, poor old Pescara. Roberto Baggio's four-goal blast sees him jump into equal third in the goal-scoring charts. Beppe Signori now has ten, but back on top, with 12 goals in eight games, the amazing Marco van Basten. No Serie A games tomorrow because of the World Cup qualifiers next week. While England are facing Turkey at Wembley, the key match in Group 1 sees Italy to play Scotland. A look at the table shows just how important a match it is, with both teams chasing the early leaders, Switzerland. James Richardson reports from the Italian headquarters. 14th of October 1992. At Cagliari, the Italian national team starts qualifications for the next World Cup. At home against the Swiss, the Italians' game is plagued by defensive errors and with nine minutes to go, Italy still trail two goals to nil. The first official game of the Arrigo Sacchi era looks set to end in ignominious defeat. What a clumsy clearance, here's Baggio now. And he scored! The Italians have pulled one back, seven minutes to go and it's 2-1. Italy's caught. Almost everybody now pressing forward for the Italians. Di Chiara. Not clear, this is Iranio, and it's there! It's 2-2! The dying seconds, and Iranio has scored! And Italy have clawed their way back into this game. And in that moment, when the ball was hit, I was focused on it to put it in. Of course, there is also a little bit of fortune, not certo. If I want to do something tomorrow, I decide to di fare gol, faccio gol, no, è stata una cosa casuale, però al momento sono stato abbastanza freddo perché eh, sapevo che erano gli ultimi sgocci di, di gara e poteva essere importante come è stato. È stata una partita faticosa per me, faticosa e, e che ha avuto un epilogo decisamente per noi soddisfacente perché all'84 stavamo perdendo 2-0 in Italia, non siamo abituati a questi recuperi. Italy Switzerland was a miraculous comeback, but in a game that should have been Italy's all the way, few are satisfied with that. A month on now from Cagliari, Italy are back at training, preparing for the next World Cup qualifier. This time they face Scotland at the Ibrox Stadium in Glasgow next Wednesday night, and we return too to test the mood in a team that's still struggling to live up to expectations. Io devo dire che non ero sicuramente soddisfatto del gioco, ma ero sicuramente soddisfatto dell'impegno che questi giocatori stavano avendo. Sacchi's made few changes to the squad for this game against Scotland. Back comes Giuseppe Signori, who was injured in the last training session. Back also comes Eugenio Corini, a midfielder from Sampdoria. The biggest news of all, though, has to be the unexpected return of Franco Baresi. Shortly before the Switzerland game, Baresi, Italy's captain and the heart of their defence, announced a long-rumoured decision, his permanent retirement from the national team. Baresi scotched suggestions of a rethink, saying that any uncertainty wouldn't be fair to his successors. The president of the Italian Federation, Antonio Materazzi, though, was careful not to rule out a rethink. And low indeed, the... Un mese fa, due mesi fa, pensavo di lasciare, di poter star meglio, di vivere meglio, ma non è stato così. 
futuro purtroppo non sapevo come, come sarebbe stato e, e allora così non vivere bene non fa bene allora ho deciso di tornare. Ho tanti compagni qui in nazionale, vedere loro che partivano quando ci sono le partite internazionali è sempre molto stimolante, così la nazionale è il massimo per ogni calciatore e, ci, e ci sono tornato indietro. Pensavo che fosse una decisione errata quella che lui aveva preso e devo dire che stavolta non mi sono sbagliato e tornato. Breezy's return couldn't have come at a better time for Saki. Italy's defence showed themselves dangerously at ease in the game against Switzerland and Breezy's experience amongst them will be essential in the tough atmosphere of Glasgow's Ibrox Stadium. Breezy è un giocatore che fa comodo a tutti quanti, tutti lo vorrebbero nella propria squadra perché è un grosso giocatore, un grande giocatore. Adesso Baresi è di nuovo in nazionale, quindi darà ancora il suo apporto che sarà sicuramente fondamentale. È un ruolo delicato che in Italia è difficile trovare uno della sua esperienza, uno della sua classe. E poi dà soprattutto tranquillità al reparto, ai compagni che giocano a fianco a lui, soprattutto per quello è importante. È tornato con entusiasmo, mi rimetto nel gruppo a disposizione del mister. Speriamo di, di far bene in questa trasferta. Baresi's back training with the squad at their ground at Covacciano near Florence. Back with him are two more of Italy's best defenders, AC Milan's Paolo Maldini and Moreno Manini of Sampdoria. With their return from injury, Saki again has the defensive elements so sorely lacking in the team's last performance. And to make extra sure the squad is well prepared, he's opened their training camp a full nine days before the Scotland game. Here at Covacciano, they're asking how long before he starts nighttime training too, and they're only half joking. Saki is a coach who's won almost every honor football has to offer in his time at AC Milan, but whether faced with a two-goal Swiss lead or the hordes with press that surround his every move, his appetite for the work still seems endless. Ma in compenso prendo tanti soldi e sono tanto famoso, quindi è chiaro che devo anche dare qualche cosa in più, è normale. With the Swiss steaming over the horizon at the top of Group 1, the Italians, Portuguese and Scots must battle it out for the group's other World Cup plays. The three teams are level on points at present, but Scotland have already played two games, a loss and a draw, results that make them considered here the underdogs for Wednesday night's game. The Scots have felt favourites before, but their chances of doing so this time have been hit hard by the injury to captain Richard Goff in the Rangers Celtic derby. In the week that Italy welcomed back their captain and defensive leader, Scotland have lost theirs. Sì, sì, manca Goff che è un ottimo giocatore, ma loro sono una squadra con un grande allenatore come Roxburgh, una squadra che ha fantasia tattica, una squadra che ha molte conoscenze tattiche, una squadra vera non solo nello spirito ma anche nelle conoscenze. Eh, delle loro armi migliori, l'agonismo, una squadra che corre molto, una squadra che attacca molto, una squadra molto aggressiva, è difficile giocare contro di loro, dovremmo essere anche noi molto aggressivi, molto veloci e poi speriamo che i nostri giocatori con le loro qualità tecniche riescano a fare la differenza. Perché loro hanno già giocato, disputato due partite, questa è la terza, noi siamo solo alla seconda partita, perciò il risultato non è proprio importantissimo per questo. It may not be as crucial a game for Italy as it is for Scotland, but that's exactly where the danger lies. Whatever the differences between the two teams, Italy know they'll be facing a Scotland team in front of their own home fans at Glasgow's Ibrox Stadium. A Scotland team fighting just to stay on the road to the World Cup. And even with Franco Baresi playing in the defence, that isn't going to be easy. No, sicuramente è molto importante, bisogna fare punti a tutti i costi, altrimenti per diventare molto più difficile. News of the internationals in next Saturday's Gazette. We'll also be looking closely at life in the Italian second division, with action from all tomorrow's games, including Cremonese. They're making a determined bid to jump back to Serie A at the first attempt, and this week they confirmed their class by beating West Ham in the Anglo-Italian Cup. And next week, a special preview of the big live game. Inter against AC Milan. Join us for both of those programs.